it was partly a case of persistence on Lord Byron's part. Much of my research is in the history of love and sex and seduction in the 18th century and obviously figures fairly large in that subject. Secondly, I grew up in Nottinghamshire and I've always been super interested in the local country estates, one of which is Newstead Abbey, the Byron's ancestral seat down near Nottingham. So as a figure, the poet Lord Byron has always loomed, just sort of been looming in the back of my mind a bit. But it was actually my main female character, Isabella Byron, who was the, um, the poet's great aunt, who actually inspired me to look further back into the family history because of a very beautiful portrait of her that still hangs at Castle Howard, where she lived as a young countess. And they've done some great research on her at Castle Howard about her early married life and about some of her travels across Europe. But there were some gaping holes in this story and I just was desperate to fill it in. So while I was pondering this, how I might go about this, if it was even possible, if the sources existed, Two other stories presented themselves to me of her two eldest brothers. The first, who was William, and he became the fifth Lord Byron, who's known to history as the Wicked Lord Byron, and he's been completely mythologised into this entirely wicked, evil, murderous, violent villain, basically. And a second brother, Admiral John Byron, whose compelling adventures after a shipwreck as a young man and being deserted on this distant unknown island off the coast of Chile were just some of the most harrowing that I'd ever read. So I was presented with these three siblings, um, basically, who had very different stories, but they were all entwined in with each other. So I was just, I really, I couldn't resist drawing those three back together, reuniting their tales um, just into one really quite dramatic 18th century family saga. Obviously the Byrons were of aristocratic lineage. They'd been in England for a good 700 years before the existence of the poet who was born in 1788. Um, the family genealogies point to the not very romantically named Ralph being the first of the family to come over around the time of the Conqueror. And he established himself um, pretty swiftly and comfortably in, with lands in Nottinghamshire and Derbyshire. So that was the family's first sort of English base. And then over the course of the next few generations, they picked up as well quite a considerable estate in Lancashire through marriage. And over the following few centuries, the family just benefited really from a sort of cautious, steady, um, confident favour at the royal court. So in 1540, they were granted Newstead Abbey, or Newstead Priory, as it was then known by Henry VIII, uh, after the dissolution of the monasteries. And this was partly for, in reward for a particular Sir John Byron's um, help in quashing rebellions against the king, also just due to Sir John's sheer persistence, he, he really wanted Newstead Abbey and, and he got it. Uh, about a century later, um, they were elevated to the peerage by Charles I in reward for um, another descendant, another Sir John Byron's loyalty to the crown on the battlefield during the civil wars. And obviously then we've got a bit of blip with the Cromwellian regime um, but with the restoration of the monarchy in the later 17th century, the family really embrace their, um, settle back into their debauches. And there are countless stories of drunkenness and debts um, and the odd venereal disease. And their continuing favour at court is actually partly credited to one Lady Byron, um, who was supposed to have been a former mistress of Charles II. That's according to Samuel Pepys anyway, and he's, he's really not very charming about it. So the family continue in this, in this career of drinking and gambling. Um, and that brings us really to the 18th century and the marriage of the William IV Lord Byron, who's in his 50s, to uh, his teenage third wife, Frances Barclay, in 1720. And the sort of growth of their brood of children um, is really where my story begins in the fall of the House of Byron. So 
Yes, Newstead came into Byron hands, as I've mentioned, in the reign of Henry VIII. And then with a few conversions and amendments, it's really transformed from this working priory to a comfortable and the preferred family seat. Um, and it had this really dramatic feel to it because of this quite unusual origin story. And you can still feel that actually when you visit today, um, it's open for visitors. Um, there's still this real sense of gothicism and drama. And also at that time, it would have been cloaked in Sherwood Forest as well. So it had this lovely aesthetic, this sort of um, irresistible country retreat, I suppose. In the time of the 1720s, we've got the fourth Lord and he embarks on this sort of twin campaign. And the first one is to revive his dynasty because he has no surviving sons from his first two marriages. And the second is to renovate his house. Um, so he embarks on this scheme of renovations. He adds a new wing, he creates a, an elegant new courtyard entrance way, and he modernises all of the interior according to the new rules really of, of good taste. And visitors lavished praise on the aesthetic of the place and also in particular for his amazing collection of art. And at the same time, his new wife is giving him their new children. There's a batch of six children of whom five are boys. So these twinned aims of his to sort of restore his dynasty and renovate his house are at this point in the 1720s seeming wildly successful. And there's this lovely personal element to the story when um, we find this account of Lady Byron who's by all accounts quite lonely at Newstead, you know she's been taken away from all of her family who live down south um, and on the births and baptisms of her children she etches their names and their birthdays into one of the windows at Newstead with a diamond and I absolutely love that little glimpse into the mother's life um, sadly it did not survive um, unless it's being kept somewhere in a parliamentary archive, um, the, the poet Byron had to present it to Parliament in order to um, legitimise his claim to taking up the peerage. So that was just one lovely little element of the Newstead story and, and how that tied in with the Byron family. But it's with his heir, William V Lord Byron, that the this family story really takes a bit of a turn um, and they suffer a downfall really, both in terms of finances and in terms of popularity or respectability. So this is partly due to William himself. He's just really not a very likeable man, uh, especially as his life goes on, he just gets worse and worse and loses most of his friends. Um, but also because his spending is absolutely out of control, both on himself and on the estate, particularly at Newstead. So he's obviously, he inherits at 13, He's obviously got a very particular vision for Newstead that he, he wants to create that's very different from his father's. He's all about the Gothic and the spectacle. So he commissions um, construction of these medieval style battlements around the lake, a miniature castle overlooking it, um, and then his own amazing replica uh, fleet of warships essentially so he can stage these mock battles at, at his parties. And to fund this, at first he rattles through his wife's fortune and spends all of that. Uh, and by his 30s, he's taking out loans, um, loans upon loans really, as the years pass, to the extent that by his 50s, he's in debt to the tune of, in modern money, it'd be many millions, many millions of pounds. And so at first he starts selling off his lands around Nottinghamshire. And then when he's forced to, he strips the abbey, basically, first of all, of its very expensive artistic masterpieces that he and his father have been collecting and then after that down to individual books or his fishing rods or even um, a set of what must have been a, a, a fancy set of toothpicks. So by the time that his successor, the poet, inherits in 1798, Newstead is a virtual ruin. Um, you know, the fifth lord hasn't been able to afford any upkeep for certain parts of the house, so there are bits where the roof has fallen in, there are halls full of straw or being used to sort of keep cattle in, to keep the cattle warm. So Newstead in a way has become by this point a sort of physical embodiment of the downfall um, 
of the fifth lord, his own decline, both financial and sort of in the esteem of the world. But as a young poet, um, as a young man, sorry, the poet was hugely inspired by Newstead and it formed the basis for some of his very earliest poetry. And uh, later in his life, as, a, as a, an older man, he said that Newstead has always suited me better than any other. So even in this state, perhaps especially in this sort of ruined, gothic, decaying state, um, it continues to seep into and shape the family's story. Yeah, it was a real privilege actually in the researching of this book to be able to handle so much archival material and particularly illuminating for me was being able to dip into the family's personal correspondence, um, which there is quite a lot surviving actually, sort of scattered in archives across the globe. So when I went into this project, I knew that what's mostly what's written about this family is very much still cloaked in 19th century myths. So if we pick up a biography of the poet, the first few pages will usually be a brief summary of the family, Byron family history. Um, and in some many cases, actually, it's still solely lifted from sources of the 1820s. It's all very much um, mythologized. So part of what I wanted to do was to restore to this family um, their own voices and to see the 18th century in as far as possible, sort of through their own eyes and from their own perspective. But that being the case, even then, you know, if you when you're able to find these voices and find these small challenges to the myths, it's really quite something. Um, and so we're able to get to grips with their thought processes, with their relationships with one another, with their sort of use of language, their terms of phrase and their points of reference as well in the stories they're telling in a way that, you know, I was able to do that in a way that I could only have hoped for at the beginning. One person who surprised me in particular was the poet's grandmother, Sophia Byron, and usually if she's ever mentioned at all, she's sort of dismissed as um, a very anxious and fragile navy wife, um, quite meddlesome and annoying really, and just constantly a bit Mrs Bennet-like, sort of flaking out on her on her chair. Um, but on, you know, in her correspondence with her friends, they're actually filled with comic stories and sort of navy inspired grit and um, you know thoughts on uh, book reviews or, or on politics so it was great to be able to shine a light on on that new aspect of her character that really has been very much ignored and actually another source of hers that was amazing was her will and it's easily the most personal and poignant that I think I've ever read. It's just 100% her voice. It's almost stream of consciousness and it's absolutely full of sorrow and fear. Um, so, you know, that was one of the most amazing finds, I think, for me during the research. One other small thing that did surprise me was a letter as well about the wastrel Jack Byron, who was the poet's father. And this was written by his sister to their brother talking about him. And she remarks, that Jack says his child is a very fine boy and seems remarkably fond of him. So that child obviously grew up to be the poet, but this isn't a part, you know, a side of Jack Byron's character that I've ever seen remarks on anywhere. You know, he's normally presented as um, entirely selfish without a care for anyone but himself. And, you know, this is just a line in the letter. It's not going to overturn his whole reputation. Um, but actions, you know, actions do speak louder than words and... and Shortly after this, he did sort of abandon wife and child and, and run off to France. But it does shine a light on the sort of charm that he's supposed to have had. He was supposed to be hugely charming, hugely handsome and, and likeable at first um, until he started asking you for money. Um, and this is something about him that's been lost in his po posthumous reputation. So it was great to see a hint of that forgotten side to him as well. With the poet, there are so many facets to his character and his history. He's, he's sort of got so many fingers in so many cultural pies that there are just loads of ways in which he can get you. Obviously, his poetry endures um, and he left behind masses of, of 
letters which will provide endless material for literary scholars and historians and they're actually a brilliant read you know there's bits sections sections of them that are just really pithy really funny really sarcastic so um we often see snippets of these sort of littering those semi-dodgy quote of the day websites but a lot of them are are true quotes um and he, he was obviously in his own time as well this this huge celebrity um People tend to refer to him as a sort of Regency rock star figure, um, which probably isn't wrong. Um, and he remained notorious as well throughout the 19th century because the debates about his private life and his sort of sexual preferences really rolled on as well then. And I think that slightly mysterious, slightly sordid element um, has to be a huge part of his lasting appeal. His reputation is tied up in scandal and, and sexual charisma. Um, people still refer to brooding handsome but dangerous Byronic heroes, even if they may never have read a word of his poetry. So I think that's partly, largely, I would say, to do with this timeless human interest in sex and love and scandal um, and just outrageous behaviour, because he is one of European history's most renowned examples of that. As well, you know, for fans of the Gothic, we've got his association with the Shelleys and his um, quite essential role in the legendary birth origin stories of uh, Frankenstein and of the reinvention of the vampire as this aristocratic sexually charged predator as well which he, he's sort of at the heart of and for Greece as well he's hugely idolised for his role in their struggle for independence um, so there's just so many angles at which we can get to him and a lot of it is wrapped up in mythologizing. you know I'm absolutely not saying he's someone we should be hero worshipping because he was absolutely not a top bloke in many ways, specifically with his treatment of women. Um, but there are just so many ways he can hook you in and so many demographics that he has some appeal to. And the more that you dig really, for, for me, the more compelling he becomes.